The next Pokemon game has been revealed and it's something quite different from what we've seen in the past, despite returning to the Kanto region. Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee are ostensibly remakes of Pokemon Yellow, with the major change being the implementation of some of the systems from Pokemon Go. It's meant to be a simpler title, drawing in those who enjoyed Go or just want a more casual Pokemon experience before Game Freak brings us Gen 8 next year. So let's bring out the old analysis machine to take a closer look at what the reveal trailer showed us and just what it's bringing to Pokemon. Let's go, shall we? We'll begin with Pikachu and Eevee themselves, as like in Yellow, they're first met in Professor Oak's lab. This is meant to be closer to the anime, so it's very likely that neither Pokemon want to be contained within their Pokeball. In fact, there's even a scene of Pikachu sitting on what was likely a capsule for his Pokeball, but that's now sitting open nearby, indicating that he doesn't want to be inside of it. We also see that there's an instant bond between the trainer and their Pokemon, as the female trainer looks absolutely delighted to have Eevee. And that's important too as it shows the trainers will likely emote much more in this game. In fact, despite not knowing where this scene takes place, we can see the trainer looking determined for some reason. They're not blank slates like in Sun and Moon. And like Yellow, you'll be able to interact with your chosen starter. In that game, it was mainly checking Pikachu's mood, but in Let's Go, players can use the motion controls to pet Eevee or Pikachu and even feed them berries as we can see in the bottom right corner. Unfortunately, we can't tell whether or not this petting and feeding applies to all of your Pokemon or just these two. However, it is very likely to be limited, just like these two are probably the only ones that can be dressed up. We see three accessories apiece for Pikachu and Eevee, with Eevee wearing a bow, a safari outfit, and even dressing up as Officer Jenny. Meanwhile, Pikachu can wear a camo outfit, sailor clothes, or even the trainer's outfit. What we're curious about though is whether both of them can wear either set of clothes or if they'll each have exclusive outfits to choose from. Either way, these costume choices will be reflected in battle, which is a nice touch. There is one scene featuring Pikachu that we're not quite sure of yet. The trainer spots Pikachu near the tall grass. Is this something that happens before becoming partners, or is it something that happens afterward? It's possible that this could be a reinterpretation of the scene where the trainer is attacked by a Pikachu only to be saved by Oak, but Pikachu doesn't exactly look threatening in this scene. That said, we are pretty sure that it takes place on Route 1. In fact, we think we can place most of the locations shown in the trailer. One of the first and most obvious is Professor Oak's lab, as Pikachu climbs onto the trainer's shoulders. It seems to be modeled closer to the incarnation seen in Fire Red and Leaf Green, as there's a large machine to the side. And another clip shows a bit more with Oak standing in front of his back wall where his computer, whiteboard, and desk are sitting, giving it more of a lab feel. There's even a picture frame on his desk and post-it notes on his desktop tower. A fun touch, though we don't know entirely if it's intentional, is that the post-its are red and blue, and so are the pens in Oak's pocket. For a Japanese audience, though, it would make sense for them to be red and green, but perhaps they're aiming more internationally this time with their references. It's not just the interior of Oak's lab that we see, though, as the exterior is shown as well. The design has been changed from the old games to stand out a bit more, but otherwise Pallet Town is the same. There's still the sign in front of the lab, another sign to the left marking it as Pallet, and two houses behind Oaks for your trainer and your rival. Even the guy that hangs out in front of the lab is still there. But this does raise the question, where is your rival? In yellow, Blue would receive an Eevee as his starter Pokemon. So if there is a rival, would he begin with the opposite Pokemon from the one you chose? It would make sense but we're not even sure the rival will be the same when the design of the trainers is quite different from the established red and leaf. What form will the rival take, if there even is a rival in Let's Go? Route 1 is also featured in several scenes, including one with Professor Oak. Here we see a flock of Pidgey fly away from him. Does this take place when the trainer attempts to go into the tall grass? Or maybe it's Oak who teaches you about catching Pokemon, rather than the old man in Viridian City? There's too little here to say for sure, but we'd assume the former. 
That's the beginning of Route 1, but there's also a short clip of the middle where we can see that it matches the original design somewhat, but the sloping paths and lines of trees from the Gen 3 remakes have been altered to appear more natural, using more than just two layers to give a sense of height. We also want to take this time to point out that rather than follow directly behind you, Pikachu and Eevee hitch a ride with Pikachu on your backpack and Eevee on your head. Moving on, we can see Route 2 and the entrance to the Viridian Forest. Unlike past games, there won't be random battles, but rather the Pokémon can be seen in the overworld, allowing you to choose who you want to try and catch. And we can already spot Rattata, Pidgey, and Weedle. Unlike other RPGs with creatures visible on the overworld, the Pokémon don't seem to actively run toward or away from your trainer. Instead, they just go about their business until you run into them but we'll get into the new capturing process a little later. Going north through the entrance, the trailer soon shows the actual Viridian Forest. We can see the trainer making her way up the right side path while passing a youngster, which is a change from past Kanto games. In every previous iteration, the forest was full of bug catchers with one last featured in yellow. And we see later that bug catchers are still a trainer type, so it's just been remixed slightly. Otherwise, the makeup of Viridian Forest is remarkably similar, and it also confirms that trainers will be lying in wait like the mainline Pokémon titles. Continuing our tour through Kanto, we come across a town that seems to be Pewter City, based on the nearby placement of the Pokémart to the Pokémon Center, which also confirms that the Mart won't be consolidated within the Center like in the newer generations. Instead, they'll be separate to maintain each town's look. Even more conclusive is the Pokeball-shaped sign north of the center, which is likely the location of the gym, given the design of the sign. This also confirms that the gyms are returning to the game, something that's really not that surprising. What is different is that the set of rocks that sat in front of the gym, separating it from the Pokemon Center, has now become a fence, airing a little closer to the pewter city of fire red and leaf green. The next location is on Route 3, where players are riding an onyx, showing that trainers can actually ride bigger Pokémon rather than simply having them follow you. And Eevee and Pikachu still ride on top of you no matter what. While this section of Route 3 looks pretty nondescript, the extra footage shown during the presentation has Onyx turn south at one point to follow along the path. And on the other side of the rocks, there's a smooth incline with no grass, which perfectly matches the area right before the entrance to Mount Moon. The next location is on Route 3, right before the entrance to Mount Moon. And the trailer actually shows this area with the Pokémon Center still right outside the mountain. In fact, the biggest difference to this spot is how the entrance to Mount Moon is now man-made. But we're soon shown the interior of Mount Moon, specifically the second floor basement. It has the same raised platform and even the leaking water from the Gen 3 remake. There doesn't seem to be any changes to the design either outside of the cosmetic upgrade. Pokémon-wise, we can see Clefairy, Geodude, Paris, and a Zubat that rises out of the ground. This means that not every Pokémon will make itself known right away. They will shift and leave and come back over time. While we don't see Cerulean City itself, we do come across the Nugget Bridge, where the trainers are challenged by Bug Catcher Kale, which happens to be the same name given to this trainer in Fire Red and Leaf Green. The actual battle with Kale is a bit different from those games though, as you'll see once we cover the battle system. Otherwise, we can also see the top of Route 5, where there's still a tree that needs cut. A Q&A after the reveal presentation has confirmed that HMs won't be featured in the games, but how will this tree be cut instead? Are ride Pokémon back like in Sun and Moon? That doesn't seem to be the case considering you can ride bigger Pokémon naturally. It might be a completely new method such as actually giving the trainer tools. We just don't know yet. Next is the underground path that connects routes 5 and 6 and serves as the way to reach Vermilion City. There's not that much different about it though save the red and blue strips that run along the straight path. However, we do see the port of Vermilion City with a building on the left and the dock that leads to a set of bushes where an empty lot is lying on the other side. Unfortunately, there's not much else to see of Vermilion, but we do know that we'll be boarding the SS Anne. It can be hard to see, yet this is definitely the deck of the Anne and a battle against a sailor. An easier look features the interior of the Anne where the trainer has Eevee use Swift against a fisherman's horsey. 
Continuing on with our tour of Kanto, we see what we believe is Selfco with the trainer taking on a Team Rocket grunt. It's not too surprising to see Team Rocket here with it being a remake of Yellow, and we even get to see their new team intro, but it does make us wonder if Jesse, James, and Meowth will make an appearance like they did in that game. It'd be pretty cool to see them in this style. But it's already pretty interesting to see the Pokemon Tower in Lavender Town through a battle. There are tombstones in the background indicating that despite the more casual nature of Let's Go, Game Freak isn't backing away completely from Pokemon's darker elements. The next route we want to feature is 14, where we see Electrode and Gengar following the trainers. It's one of the few places with water on the right that doesn't take place on a dock. We can also see a biker and a bird keeper with two of them side by side, which could mean an opportunity for a double battle. So far, most of the locations we've seen have been pretty close to their original incarnations, with only some minor changes, if any at all. But Route 17 Cycling Road has been overhauled almost completely. It still features water in the middle of the route and bikers to challenge, but there's one thing missing, your bike. We see Route 17 several times, and not once is the trainer riding the bike. That also means there's no incline making it hard to go up the route or causing you to cycle back down if you release the D-pad. This means that either the bike is completely optional now, or that it was cut completely since players can easily run and there was no need for a speed up. It may also have been cut because of the multiplayer and the logistics of having the second player have their own bike. It seems simple offhand, but the way the second player is treated in Let's Go makes it a little more complicated since that extra player uses the first player's inventory. Not only did the route change because of the bike, but its entire design now seems significantly changed. At no point was there a thin patch of grass after water sitting in the middle of the route. This is all new and so are most of the Pokemon seen in this clip. Neither Pidgey nor Psyduck could be found on Route 17 in any past Pokemon game. Psyduck could only be found in the Seafoam Islands or while fishing with the Super Rod in certain locations in Red and Blue, while it was limited to surfing on Route 6 in Yellow. But Raticate could absolutely be found here. Other scenes appear to show just how much the route has changed. As the trainer rides a Charizard through the route, we can see both a Beauty and a Picnicker down below both of whom never appeared on Route 17 before, lending further evidence to the idea that this is no longer a cycling path. But more interesting is that this patch of grass first appears to be the same as the northeastern patch from the original game, which was the only grass on that route. However, gameplay from the presentation shows that this is actually south of where the Psyduck is shown, and considering the presence of signs, this is actually the middle path of Route 17. But of course, now it's the only path and is a much thinner route than before with a road that stays connected. And this is absolutely Route 17 because of the presence of Ponyta and Dodrio, both of which only appeared here in yellow. The last we see of the route is just before the trailer ends with Eevee jumping out of the TV. Just below the picnicker are a set of benches and a Pokeball hidden amongst the flowers. This indicates another big change for Route 17 as it only had hidden items in previous games. Will hidden items no longer be a thing in Let's Go, or is it a change just for this route? Either way, it makes us curious if any other areas will be as overhauled as this. For example, Fuchsia City has seen a makeover to give it more of a Japanese look, which ties into Koga's ninja theme even though the gym leader wasn't shown. Otherwise though, the layout is near identical other than the lack of a fence near the eastern house. Route 20 also appears the same, although it is just a water route. But seeing the trainer ride on Lapras does make us curious as to whether Surf is being used or if this happens naturally with Lapras in the same way as Onyx and Charizard. In fact, could Charizard just fly over the water? And since there are no HMs, does Lapras just need placed in the first slot? These are mysteries that unfortunately don't have an answer yet. And finally, we have this encounter with Magmar, which was never available in yellow or red, only blue. So this must be the Pokemon Mansion. But it does raise the excellent point that Pokemon encounters do have to be remixed somewhat due to yellow being split into two with Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. So it makes sense to pull some of the Pokemon locations from the other Kanto games. 
Now we've seen plenty of locations in Pokemon, but one of the biggest changes in Let's Go is the way players will catch Pokemon. After all, there's no way to battle wild Pokemon in this game. Once you encounter one, the screen shifts to a Pokemon Go-like experience. There are four options available, get ready where you throw a Pokeball, items to help you catch them though we don't see anything specific, help which may give tips on throwing Pokeballs, and run away to get away from the encounter as quickly as possible. If get ready is chosen, it really does become like Go, even down to the circle indicating the best time to throw a Pokeball while indicating how tough the capture is. The darker the circle, the harder the catch. The timing aspect of throws has also been carried over from Go as ranks such as Nice and Great can appear when the ball hits the Pokemon at just the right time, likely improving your chances of catching that Pokemon. What's really curious though is the stats shown in these wild encounters. In this case, the Clefairy's level and gender is shown, which is standard, along with its CP or combat power, which is lifted from Pokemon Go. In Go, CP is used to indicate how much power your Pokemon has when challenging gyms. But since Let's Go has proper levels and, as we'll see later, the standard battle system, it seems pointless to list. Perhaps the amount of CP indicates what a Pokemon's level will be, which would make sense considering Pokemon can be transferred from Go to Let's Go, so they would need levels in this game. But even that's strange, as why would the Pokemon that appear in Let's Go need CP when they can't be transferred to the mobile game? It feels like there's an element to this that hasn't been properly explained yet. While it's not explained in the trailer, it stands to reason that the number that appears below Pokemon during Wild Encounters denotes how many Pokeballs the player has. It shows 32 below Clefairy and 31 for Psyduck. We'll cover the multiplayer soon enough, but we are curious if playing with a friend means that two Pokeballs are used if both are thrown at the same time. It would make sense, but it's not confirmed. It is shown, however, that Pokeballs aren't the only thing that can be thrown at a Pokemon. Ultra Balls make an appearance as well, which naturally means Great Balls will be there too, each one increasing the catch rate. Despite that, the dark orange coloring on the Snorlax's circle indicates it's still going to be a tough one to get. And is this one of the Snorlax blocking a route until you get the Poke Flute, or can it be spotted in the wild? This one change to the battle system tweaks more aspects of the game than you might think originally. Such as, will the Master Ball appear like it did in Yellow? Or will it be skipped entirely in favor of a challenge? After all, there's a scene showing the showdown with Mewtwo, which has much more of an introduction than the original games. It might come across as a bit of a letdown if you can just toss a Master Ball at it and catch it immediately like in those games. Of course, it would also be a shame if you threw the Master Ball and whiff completely. Talk about heartbreaking. Once you catch a Pokemon, you'll naturally get its Pokedex entry, and the Pokedex shows much of the information that you would expect, such as its gender, type, and a small entry about it. But these aren't new entries. Instead, they're lifted almost exactly from Pokemon Yellow, further cementing the idea that this is a remake of that game. Beyond that, the Pokedex shows how many Pokemon of that type you've caught and their record heights and weights. You can also put it in motion and change the language on the fly. However, the most interesting aspect of the Pokedex is the option to change the Pokemon's form. This indicates that Alolan forms of the first 151 Pokemon will be featured in the game, something confirmed during the presentation's Q&A. This makes a lot of sense considering Pokemon Go has just introduced Alolan forms, well before the brand new Gen 7 Pokemon are even considered to be added to the mobile game. Tying into the catching aspect is the brand new two-player option. From everything we've seen though, it doesn't look like the second player can import their trainer into the game for the co-op, at least not yet. Instead, a simple shake of the Joy-Con brings in the other trainer as an extension of yours. Both of you play on the same screen, but Player 2 is limited to what Player 1 has. For example, in Wild Encounters, Player 2 can only get ready to throw their Pokeball or choose from items. Even though we're not shown them, we can assume that Player 2 simply pulls from the items that Player 1 already has. While this might use up resources more quickly, there are benefits to it. 
The biggest is that if the two players are able to time their Pokeball throws together, then they can receive an excellent bonus that combines the Pokeballs into one for a much better chance at a catch. So if you're having trouble with certain Pokemon, you can either have a friend help or try to use both Joy-Con yourself. The second player can also have a Pokemon follow behind them, but since they don't have either Pikachu or Eevee, we believe this indicates they're using one of Player 1's Pokemon. Perhaps the Pokemon in the second slot will be the one to follow Player 2, or maybe this has to be actively set as one scene shows Player 2 without a following Pokemon. And there is strategy to this, as having two players also means that every battle against a trainer is a double battle. For the first time in the series' history, a double battle can be in the player's favor, where they have two Pokemon right from the start, while the opponent only has one. Now granted, the only time we see this in action is when the opposing trainer only has one Pokemon to begin with, so it's possible that they'll toss out two if they can when you approach them in co-op mode. Otherwise though, from what we can see, battles play out as they do in core Pokemon titles. As we mentioned earlier, players can encounter Bugcatcher Kale on Nugget Bridge, which is the same trainer in the same spot from Fire Red and Leaf Green. After all, trainers didn't have names in the original Red, Blue, and Yellow. But the name is the only thing that's the same, as Kale only has a level 9 Venonat, rather than his level 14 Weedle and Caterpie from Gen 1, or the four level 10 Pokemon from the GBA remakes. It may have needed balancing since we're not sure how players will train their Pokemon in Let's Go, since there are no wild battles. Is it possible to have rematches against trainers? There must be some method since both Pikachu and Bulbasaur are at level 18, well above what they should be at this point. However, this does confirm that, like Yellow, players will likely be able to obtain the three Kanto starters through their adventure. Bulbasaur is obtained in the house next to the Pokemon Center in Cerulean, after all, right before Nugget Bridge. And that makes it all the more unbelievable that both it and Pikachu have such a high level. Not only that, but Pikachu's move pool is rather strange. It only has three moves rather than four, and no matter the generation, it should have four moves by level 18. Why is this not the case? It is for Bulbasaur, who has a full set of four moves, and based on the presence of Takedown, it looks like its move pool is based on what it's had since Gen 4. So does this mean that players can simply choose not to learn a move, even when they have less than four, which has never been possible before? Otherwise, the battles are what you'd expect. There's levels, HP, and even PP for each move. The moves themselves are color-coordinated and have symbols to further help differentiate them. There's no sign of CP at all, so again, why is it featured during Wild Encounters? Maybe it ties into the Pokémon you have. After all, the amount of Pokémon you've caught is noted in the Pokédex, so maybe the more of a certain Pokémon you have, the faster it will level. It's a wild guess and still makes no sense for Bulbasaur, so we're just not sure. Maybe you simply receive Bulbasaur at level 15, or perhaps Bulbasaur is that strong because it was transferred from Pokemon Go. While we don't know the full process, we do see that a Pokemon can be moved from Go to Let's Go, where it will then take residence in the Go Park. What happens after that, we're not sure. There's no indication that the Pokemon can be taken with you, and instead all we see is the Pokemon in a kind of ranch. But there's certainly plenty of variety as we see Dratini, Venomoth, Clefairy, Nidoqueen, Zapdos, and Charizard. Are they simply for the Pokedex? Can you take them with you? Or are they beneficial in another way? There's just no clear answer. Alright, we're almost done here, but there's still a few things we wanted to point out. First of all, we get to see the pause menu, which doesn't have many options, so it might be a quick pause so that players can save or immediately choose to take your Pokémon for a stroll using the Pokéball Plus. There, it can be taken with you and even make noises as you travel in order to receive something special. We still don't know what that is, but this is a taste of the process. Otherwise, we see plenty of Pokémon moves in action. There's Dragonite and Sylphco using Hyper Beam, Blastoise using Hydro Pump in what is likely the Team Rocket base, Arbok using Glare and Sylph, Cloyster using Shell Smash on the water, a Magikarp getting hit by Seismic Toss, and Golem using Self Destruct or Explosion on a Snorlax. Considering just how big the blast is, we're thinking it's Explosion. 
although all the moves do have a great visual flair. But that's everything that we could find in the Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee reveal trailer. It's filled with just as many familiar elements as new ones, making for a game that's intriguing in its own way. There are still so many aspects of this Yellow remake that we don't fully understand, but at the most basic level, we are interested in seeing more. Of course, if we missed anything, let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and be sure to hit that subscribe button for future analyses and even more from Game Explained.